Did you know CIUS response continues the dialogue about Ukraine and the Ukrainian Canadian narrative in the media today? Today's conversation is with Dr. Latouk, professor at the Royal Military College of Canada. Professor Latouk specializes in the political geography of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, refugee studies, and the ethnic and immigration history of Canada. Welcome, Professor. Good afternoon. Recently, much has been said of the military unit Waffen SS Galicia Division, including the history of how members of that division were screened, found not to have been guilty of criminal activity, and eventually given full papers and civilian status in Canada. We have also heard about three different commissions clearing the division members of any war crimes, including the Deschamps Commission here in Canada. But this too has come into question. Let's discuss this a bit if we can. Certainly. Professor, Professor Lutzuk, can you tell us about Operation Payback? Who organized it? And whom did it target? Well, when I was involved as a participant appearing before the Commission of Inquiry on War Criminals that was headed by the uh, Mr. Justice Jules Deschamps. That was in 1984 that we get, began sort of getting worried about this issue. Uh, it was constituted and it continued its work until April of 1987. When we were appearing before it, uh, as members of the Civil Liberties Commission under the chairmanship of John Gergorovich, we always had this suspicion, and that's all it was, uh, that this whole issue had been somehow stoked up, provoked by the Soviets, but we couldn't prove it. So we went through the Duchenne Commission, and we can talk about that in a few minutes. In terms of Operation Payback, what that is, is now conclusive proof of what our suspicion was, namely that the Soviet Union, specifically the KGB, the Soviet secret police, initiated a campaign we don't know exactly when, but sometime in the late 1970s. And the purpose of that campaign was pretty straightforward. They were afraid or concerned that given the cooperation that was starting to exist between Ukrainian dissidents and human rights activists inside the Soviet Union and Jewish refusals, that the combination of those two groups of dissidents and human rights activists inside the Soviet Union, if supported by the Ukrainian, Baltic, and Jewish diasporas in the emigration, could cause them problems. So in order to disrupt any possibility of cooperation between Jews and Ukrainians and Baltic communities as well in the West, they began inserting what we would today call fake news stories into the Western media. They began circulating leaflets, films, planning stories and newspapers. And the whole intention was to raise this question of there are thousands of Nazis or alleged Nazis hiding in North America. Look at that. Jews in North America should, of course, rally to weed out these villains in their midst, in our midst. And so that provoked, of course, a struggle between the Jewish and principally the Ukrainian diasporas. Um, it was a campaign that I'll have to say, hats off to the KGB, very successful. They played off stereotypes. They played off old prejudices on both sides. They did this extensively. And in the document that we have that was actually discovered by Professor Olga Bertelson from 1985, we know that they actually bragged about being so successful with Operation Payback that the United States government was, as they put it, forced to establish the Office of Special Investigations in the Department of Justice in the United States, which then went after only alleged Nazi war criminals. And then building on that success as they saw it, they said, we'll do the same thing in Canada. And they actually talk about how they planted fake stories in the Toronto Star, how they provoked in Canada the creation of the Commission of Inquiry on War Criminals headed by Mr. Justice Deschamps. So in 1985, the KGB were openly among themselves talking about how they orchestrated this subterfuge, how they spread this disinformation, how they managed to provoke such angst and anger, understandably, of course, in the diaspora communities that they went after each other over this tendentious, contentious issue, and any possibility of them cooperating against Soviet interests was certainly disrupted for many, many years. So that was Operation Payback in a nutshell, what we always suspected, 
when we were actually appearing before Justice Deshen and engaging with journalists and others in the public domain, we always said, well, this must, where did this all come from all of a sudden? Um, and specifically in the in the document that we're referring to, the one from 1985, they mentioned the fact that the Galicia division was a perfect target, even though, as you've pointed out, veterans of that division were screened in Rimini in northeastern Italy right after the war by British, Canadian, American, and even Soviet investigators and found not guilty of any war crimes, were then held in uh, labor camps in England for a few years. Again, questions were raised about who they were. Nothing was found. Before some of them emigrated to Canada, Cabinet was contacted by the Canadian Jewish Congress, which said, you're not letting these Nazis in, these SS men into Canada. So Cabinet, the highest level of the government of Canada, contacted the High Commissioner for Canada in the United Kingdom, uh, Dana Wilgris, who investigated it and reported back to Ottawa that this was all nothing but communist propaganda, quote unquote. And that's when some of them were allowed to come to Canada and have ever since led productive lives. But again, the Soviets kept trying. They started, as I say, in the late 70s and in the 80s, we had the Commission of Inquiry on War Criminals, which came to the same conclusion that the screeners had come to in 1945-46 in Rimini, the same one they'd come to in 1950, namely that there was no evidence of wartime uh, criminality on the part of the division, that mere membership in the division was not a grounds for prosecution, and also concluding that the government of Canada was fully aware of who these men came, were when they came, and so you can't now denaturalize and deport them. So that it this should have been done, finished in 1987. And yet, because of the genocidal war being waged against Ukraine and Ukrainians by another KGB man in the Kremlin, what do we have? We have the same old stories surfacing, the same old players provoking it, and unfortunately, a large number of journalists who apparently can't read, have never looked at the Duchenne Commission report, have never considered what was discovered and uncovered and discussed and debated way back then, and now want to bring it all back again for no good reason. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience working in the with the Duchenne's Commission and, and its conclusions? Well, as I say, I was we weren't working for the Duchenne Commission. There was a group organized... Uh, in Toronto called the Civil Liberties Commission. It was associated with the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, but independent of the Congress. It was headed by John Gregorovich, a lawyer in Toronto, and he had a number of volunteers who worked with him. I had moved from Alberta, from finishing up my PhD at the University of Alberta in 1984 to take a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto. So I happened to be in Toronto and I had just finished my dissertation on the post-World War II immigration of Ukrainians to Canada, the so-called displaced persons or DPs, including veterans of the Divisia. So I was very well informed. I'd studied the archives. I'd interviewed veterans of the Divisia and many other refugees who came to this country after the Second World War. And I was asked to join this Civil Liberties Commission and make representations to the government and to Mr. Duchenne on all of these issues. So I worked with John and, of course, with the late and great John Sapinka, who later went on to the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, he was the lawyer that we had engaged to represent the Civil Liberties Commission. And he did so remarkably well. So over the period of those two and a half very difficult years, because as you can imagine, I must be very clear on this. I totally understand why my fellow Jewish Canadian citizens would be concerned that there might be a Nazi next door. You know, if we want to put it in the most silly, blunt terms, Ukrainians weren't Nazis and members of the division were Nazis. But let's just use the, the common phrasing, a Nazi next door. After all, we all know, know about the Holocaust. We know that there were Ukrainians who collaborated with the German occupation in the Holocaust, whether out of fear or greed or under duress or out of ideological conviction, whatever. There were such people. There were such people in every single nation in Europe. There's nothing unique about Ukraine. There were divisions of SS men organized by the Walloons, by the, think of Finland. Finland fought the Soviets in 1940. We don't call them Nazis. At any rate, um, the, the issue here is we made representations to the government at the time where we basically said, look, we understand the concern of the Canadian Jewish Congress and B'nai B'rith and so on. No one wants any war criminals in Canada. So our principal position was back then and remains to this very day. 
that any war criminal found in Canada, if there is credible evidence of that individual's wrongdoing, regardless of who they are, where they were, ethnicity, nationality, gender, creed, color, all that stuff, doesn't matter who they are. If there is credible evidence, credible evidence, that a person committed a war crime or a crime against humanity, put that before the authorities, let the authorities review it and determine if that person should be brought to trial, and if so, in a Canadian criminal court of law. End of position. That is fair, it is just, it is blind, but it's not selective. The problem with the Duchenne Commission was that it was selective. It only looked at so-called Nazi war criminals in Canada. It ignored uh, the evidence about there being individuals who served in the NKVD, Smirsch, KGB, served Soviet interests and committed war crimes and were in Canada, at least four of them. I'm not saying 40, not saying 400, not even saying 4,000. You know, all these grossly exaggerated figures that were bandied about by Nazis were dismissed by Duchenne. Uh, I was actually looking at his report just this morning. Here it is. And the reality of it is virtually all of the cases that he looked at were submitted by individuals who provided no evidence at all. No evidence at all. They would denounce people. They'd name people. They'd say, we read it in a newspaper published somewhere in Eastern Europe. They said we would get anonymous tips. They'd bring them forward. Deshen would investigate them. And in some cases, he'd go to the person who said, well, that guy is a Nazi. Well, what are your evidence? I don't have any. I just think so. Or in one case, Canadian Jewish Congress submitted a name, said that we heard from this person that this man was this, that, and the other. Deshen went back to the original informant and she said, I never said that. So you can imagine how anxious ridden people were, how troubling this was. People were denouncing each other. People were putting names forward. And of course, among those were the names of veterans of the Divisia. I don't know whether it was out of ignorance of the wartime history or deliberate or malicious or Soviet attempt to undermine the Ukrainian Canadian community. But many of the uh, so-called cases were, you know, this man was a veteran of the Galicia division, although there's nothing against him personally. And so Deshen eventually, as I say, concluded that having examined the wartime history of the Divisia, he found no evidence of wartime criminality. He found plenty of evidence of the fact that uh, these men had been screened amply and concluded that you can't indict the unit for war crimes and that these men came legally to Canada. So uh, the current controversy that I'm sure you're aware of in the House of Commons um, is in a sense unfair because this individual came to Canada legally. The government knew who he was and what his wartime activities had been. And as far as I know, and I don't know the man, uh, there's no evidence against him of any wartime criminality. And as far as I know, he has been a good, upstanding citizen taxpayer in Canada ever since. So why is he being pilloried internationally? It seems, again, to be nothing but a miasma generated to um, inflame passions and distract from the genocidal war being waged by the KGB men in the Kremlin against Ukraine and Ukrainians. That's really what I see this as being. Well, and understanding how this current narrative in the media has caused great pains to the Jewish community and pain to the Ukrainian community as well. What actions can we take to move our communities forward? Well, I think, look, some of my colleagues on the Jewish Canadian side of this fence, if you like, have called for the release of all the Duchenne Commission files. I think that's a mistake in the sense that many of these cases I've already told you were unsubstantiated, there was no evidence. So let's say now, 36, 40 years later, you publish all of those names. You say, Mr. Mueller, who lived in Belleville, was allegedly a war criminal. There was no evidence found against him. And so the case was um, dismissed. Meanwhile, he's probably gone. I mean, there are very few people alive. I mean, I was surprised to even see a Divizinik who was 98. You know, I mean, there, there can't be many people that age. But OK. Mr. Mueller, I'm using just that name, pulling it out of the hat, is a German name, German-Canadian name, was accused of something, and it turns out there was no evidence, so it was dismissed. Now we put his name into the public domain. He may have children. He may have grandchildren. And they're now going to be approached by someone saying, how do you feel about the fact that your grandfather was accused of being a Nazi war? What, what, does, what good does this serve? You know, when you think about it, 
because again, I've heard some of my colleagues say, well, these men swore an oath to Adolf Hitler. So did every single German soldier, every member of the Luftwaffe, Wehrmacht, and so on. They all swore an oath to Adolf Hitler. He was the head of state. There was no choice. And so, yeah, they all swore an oath to Adolf Hitler. Gags, you know, you gag thinking about it. But the reality of it is, they all did it. So was every German soldier in the Third Reich a Nazi? That's ridiculous. It's like saying that everyone in the Canadian Armed Forces today is a liberal or a conservative or a monarchist be be because they swear allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen or now King Charles III. You know, it, there's a difference here between swearing an oath and what your political sympathies may be. Insofar as I know from having interviewed the Wiesenike, from having interviewed the men and women, the Canadian men and women who served overseas during the war fighting the Nazis and later rescued the Divisia, interviewing them, they wouldn't have rescued Nazis. I talked to all these people. I looked at the records of the time and I never found any evidence that these men were anti-Semitic, that they were pro-Nazi or supported the war aims of the Third Reich. They were fighting to defend their Western Ukrainian homeland against a second Soviet occupation, having experienced the first one and knowing what the Soviets were bringing. They saw the bodies. They saw the torture chambers. They saw what the Soviets left in their wake as they retreated from their former allies in July or late June, July of 41. So these people who joined the Divisa, teenagers, and swore this oath, weren't doing it to fight against France or England or America or Canada. They weren't fighting our soldiers. They were fighting our recent ally, the Soviet Union, who just before June 22nd, 41, was still supporting Adolf Hitler, who was killing Canadians and British and French soldiers and others in Western Europe. So, you know, well, you know, this man fought against our allies. No, he didn't. He fought against the Soviets who were invading his homeland. He was defending his family, his country against a hated, understood foe. Same foe we're fighting today. Um, now, would I have joined the Divisia? Should people have joined the Divisia? Were there other options? Not many. Not everybody joined the Divisia. Not everyone who joined the Divisia was a good man, I suppose. I mean, you know, and no military unit is full of angels. And it is a war. So, again, if there is evidence of someone having committed a war crime, this person committed a war crime, bring the evidence forward. You know, you can't just say... They're all bad because we've gone through that. We've gone through that several times. Why are we doing this again? If you have evidence against the individual who appeared in the House of Commons, which I agree was an unfortunate situation. It shouldn't have happened given the potential sensitivities, but it happened. I think it was an innocent mistake. The Speaker of the House has paid a serious penalty for his error. He's resigned from a prestigious position. Okay. He took... He accepted responsibility, he did the right thing, and he resigned. The man who invited one of his constituents, whom, as I say, I don't know, didn't do anything wrong. And yet he's been, you know, vilified internationally. Again, someone wants to stand up and say, I have the evidence against that man. Well, good. Go to the RCMP War Crimes Unit, table it, and they can investigate it. And I'm all for it. But if you don't have the evidence, what are you doing? Who are you serving, consciously or otherwise? Some of the people who are doing this, I am convinced, know absolutely what they are doing. And that is trying to distract from the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine, are trying to undermine the Ukrainian Canadian community as we rally in support of Ukraine, as Ukrainians defend themselves against this unprovoked aggression on the part of, frankly, Russian fascists. You want to talk about Nazis? Look at the people who are invading Ukraine. Look at the rapes. Look at the mass killings. Look at the abduction of children. It's a genocidal agenda. People should be focused on that. Instead, we're now being dragged back to fight World War II. I think this is a pure blind, unnecessary, divisive, and very un unrequired kind of uh, issue to raise at this time. Again, the archives are there. I don't say destroy the archives. I think the Duchesne Commission archives, all of them, should be preserved and should be made open to historians and scholars in due course, but not in the context of the current war against Ukraine, and certainly not now, because you're not going to bring anyone to justice 
you're only going to inflame all these old passions. You're going to reopen old wounds, as they say. So unless there's evidence, and there was no evidence way back then, I don't think there's any evidence now, just stop. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. And uh, we will continue the dialogue. It's not well, ending. And we do need to put it into perspective and look at what's happening in Ukraine today as well. Yes. So thank well, you for, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm sorry that this issue has to be raised yet again. As are we. Have a good day.